All right. <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, esteemed members of the Académie Libanaise des Beaux-Arts, it is my utmost pleasure to present you on this fine evening one of the most prominent figures in contemporary philosophy and architecture theory, Graham Harmon, joining us here at ALBA as part of our series of student-organized talks. I would even go to length as to remove the term contemporary from my previous statement, as the influence and works of Graham Harmon far exceed the limiting notion of a contemporary era. In a way, they transcend times and schools of thought and boldly and strongly propose new visions or new understandings of the whole that is around us, but also architecture in specific. When I was first given the task to present Graham Harmon, I was in my room quarantined and COVID infected. It had also been a while since I had pondered upon any useful thought, to be honest, and so my memory got refreshed again to when I first met Graham Harmon's mind in my third year of architecture, which was a bit late in my opinion, and the aftermath of the cultural shock listening and reading him gave me. I was then sat in my room, now pondering on my very existence, on myself, the object of me, or any object there, me, COVID, the plant, the spider web, existentially, but not in an existential way. And I thought that this rush of feelings very well described how I understood what I understand from Graham Harmon. One thing to note in particular about Graham Harmon is his strong anchoring in commonly known concepts, which in turn allows him to be able to move past them to present his own self. He does not particularly align himself to any specific set of philosophical restrictions. I cite, for instance, the distinction of object and thing to a large number of philosophers, such as Heidegger, for example, to which Graham Harmon responds by saying that he rather use object, thing, and entity interchangeably to have synonyms for everything, to avoid repetition, but also mainly to avoid, and I quote, the sort of pedantic precision which demands that each term have a single meaning that the author is obliged to define. It's kind of liberating, I think. What Graham Harmon can be aligned with, on the other hand, is his central and influential position in the realm of speculative realism, which essentially rejects anthropocentrism while supporting a sort of metaphysical realism through the rejection of correlationism. These two aspects, clearly seen in his own object-oriented ontology, or OOO or triple O, which states that everything is an object, me, a shadow, space-time, the undertaker, and so on. It's from there that he moves even further to start exploring the world of architecture in specific, zero form, zero function, which I assume we will be hearing about more tonight. An interesting aspect of Harmon's life is his work as an online sports reporter, which he had while pursuing his PhD at DePaul University. Uh, he also then taught at, uh, the at the American University in Cairo from 2000 till 2016. Uh, at which he left at the rank of distinguished professor of philosophy that he now fulfills at the sci -Arc, the Southern California School of Architecture. Graham Harmon, uh, it was an honor and a pleasure for me to uh, present you tonight. Uh, I wish to everyone here with me live in the auditorium and uh, joining us on WebEx uh, a pleasant hearing. The word is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. It's wonderful to be back in Beirut, even if only virtually. Uh, during my years in Cairo, I visited Beirut many times and saw most of Lebanon and was always one of my favorite places to travel. And I hope to join you all again someday. It's been too long. All right. The title uh, of this lecture that I announced was Derelationizing Architecture. And so first you might be wondering, why would we want to derelationize architecture, or what does that mean? So let me start by talking about that. Uh, Object-oriented ontology, or triple O, is a philosophy that's interested in considering objects insofar as they are non-relational. But this needs some clarification, because obviously objects relate to each other. Objects affect each other. It's one of the most basic facts of our world. And especially in, in theoretical disciplines these days, interrelationality, interactivity is very popular. Many people think this concept is the key to solving all philosophical problems. We have to look at things in their context. We have to look at how they affect each other rather than trying to look at things in a vacuum, which is considered a very conservative or reactionary move. 
But there's a problem with relationality, which is that if we push it too far, a thing becomes entirely the product of its contents and it, uh, context and its circumstances. You can see this clearly, for instance, in actor network theory of Bruno Latour, one of my, actually my favorite contemporary philosophy other than my own, uh, in which for Latour, a thing is what it does. That's all it is. There's nothing in the thing beyond what it is doing right now to other things. Actors act, actors affect other actors, and that's all there is to them. There's nothing hidden behind that. There's a problem with this, though, which is that if you say that a thing is nothing more than what it's doing right now, a thing is nothing more than its current relations, one problem is that you can't explain its future relations. If I am nothing more than the fact that I am lecturing virtually in Beirut right now, how can you explain that I'll be giving a different lecture next week in Turkey or that I'll be doing it in Texas in person a month from now? So a thing needs to be able to be detachable from its current circumstances and movable so that it has a certain inner characteristic to it that is not coming from the outside, but is within and is simply not currently being activated. So when I talk about de uh, derelationizing architecture, that's what I talk, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about removing all relations from architecture. I'm talking about opening our attention to the non-relational character of the elements of architecture as well. So uh, this gets us close to what in the history of the arts and architecture is often called formalism. Formalism is the idea that a thing has a certain inherent characteristic that is cut off from its surroundings to some extent. So for example, formalism in literary theory means you don't focus on the social or political context of the work, you simply look at the text itself. Uh, formalism in the visual arts means you're trying not to focus on a story told by a painting. You're trying to look at the relation between the content of the painting and the background medium, the fact that canvas is flat and therefore paintings should not try to be three-dimensional illusions that tell a story. Paintings should be signaling their awareness of the flat two-dimensional background, as in cubism, uh, which is the favorite art style of most formalist art critics, because cubism isn't trying to give an illusion of three-dimensional depth. It's simply trying to acknowledge the flatness of painting and keep everything on the surface. Uh, or in architecture, uh, in architecture, it's slightly different because what formalism opposes is functionalism. Form and function is the, the leading formalist distinction in architecture. Now, there are problems with this, of course, too. As I've mentioned, relations are not a bad thing. Relations are not something we should get rid of. But there's also a substantial truth in formalism that to a certain extent, everything is partly self-contained. Imagine a uh, supposedly site-specific work of art or architecture. Imagine a, a, let's say art, because most architecture has to be site-specific in some way. Imagine a site-specific work of art, such as a public sculpture. All right, it may be site-specific. It may need to be in this particular site for certain reasons. But any physical site has an infinite number of features, and no artwork is going to interact with all of those. So if there is an, uh, an artwork or a piece of architecture that is site-specific, it will usually be interacting with four or five or six aspects of the site. There's an infinite amount of history or an infinite amount of complexity in every site that you can work with, but no one is able to work with all of it. And so you're making certain decisions about which parts of the site to interact with. So there are relations, but they are limited. They are always limited to a small, finite number. The same is true even of a human life. If you, if you look back at your life, especially when you get a bit older like I am, you'll find that there were maybe a half dozen things in your life that really affected you irreversibly. Places, people, events. Uh, and the others may have been interesting at the time, but they don't, somehow they don't leave a lasting impact on you. And I talked about this in my book, Immaterialism, where I was talking about a historical object, the Dutch East India Company. And I tried to show that unlike what actor network theory would, would have you believe, the Dutch East India Company and its history is not just a series of, of noisy incidents. The Dutch East India Company only went through about a half dozen changes that affected it irreversibly, so that it was not the same company as it was before those events. And uh, you can read that book if you want. It's, it's uh, the only one of my books I can ever reread. I hate rereading my books. I don't know how other authors feel. Uh, for me, rereading my books is like staring in the mirror for three hours. It's very awkward. It's uncomfortable. But Immaterialism is the one book of my own that I love rereading, perhaps because it's so short. Uh, but I would recommend that to you on this topic. In any case, um, 
there are also certain tendencies in architecture to address the form function distinction differently. And I wanna challenge each of those today. One thing you could do is say that form doesn't matter, the function and the, 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 the program, the function are what matter in architecture. And I don't know who has said this, but you, I suppose Bernard Schumi emphasizes this in some way, and maybe there are some engineers who argue that, that architectural design briefs are basically engineering problems and that you simply solve them for maximum performance. That's a possible position you could have. The problem with that position, of course, is that uh, there are many different formal ways to solve a given arch architectural problem. And so it, there's still a design problem. There's not just a calculation of maximum performance for any building. You could do like Peter Eisenman and do the opposite and say that uh, uh, architecture has always been about form. And you could even go as far as Eisenman does in some of his houses and actually deliberately sabotage the functioning of his buildings so that you have columns through the bed, the bed or through the dining room to make people think in some way. And so you are turning the building then into a legible text in the manner of Derrida instead of treating it as a medium or an object in which one resides or that one sees from the outside. Uh, and again, the problem there is that then you are verging on architecture as sculpture. If you take completely take away the social purposes of the building, you are verging on sculpture. So you're giving up some of the resources of architecture. The other thing you could do is you could simply deny that there's a distinction between form and function, either by saying that form always follows function, Louis Sullivan, or simply by claiming that it's impossible to separate those two. And I'm going to say there are problems with that as well. But first, I want to link this to Immanuel Kant. And even if you're not a philosophy student with a philosophy background, it's pretty easy to explain uh, why Kant is relevant to this discussion. In some ways, Immanuel Kant is still the dominant influence on aesthetics, even now, 200 and some years later, the critique of judgment. The idea that uh, an artwork is not reducible to a conceptual paraphrase of it, the idea that an artwork should not be reducible to personal preference and feelings, the idea that we should judge art uh, in a disinterested fashion from a certain contemplative distance, that it's a matter of taste and that we shouldn't get personally involved in the artwork. Uh, all of this is one of the major currents, even in contemporary aesthetics. And you could say that the, the, op the really the, the main opposite trend is the Hegelian trend. The idea that a work of art or architecture is a cultural production that appears at a certain historical moment as a moment of geist or spirit and is influenced by its surroundings and is an expression of its surroundings. And you get this in the Frankfurt School also, another leading school of aesthetics. So in a sense, all, all aesthetic theory is to some extent still either Kantian or Hegelian. Now, um, the problem with the Hegelian approach, as I see it, is, is that you run the risk of losing the artwork as an autonomous thing. You run the risk of turning it into simply an expression of its time and place historically. And the main argument against that is that, first of all, if you call something a product of, a time, of its time and place, that's not really a compliment. That means that somebody is just a typical novelist of 1950s America. Uh, it means there's, it's an expression of its time. It's not something that can outlast its time. Whereas if you think of universally recognized great arts, think, for example, of Shakespeare. Shakespeare, of course, was written under the condi conditions of England under Queen Elizabeth I. And that leaves a certain mark on its plays, but you can also produce Shakespeare in Malaysia in 2022 and the audience will still grasp it and understand what's going on. There's something about Shakespeare, along with many other artists, that travels very well across time and space and isn't limited to the conditions of its production. So I think Kant has an advantage there over the Hegelian approach. The fact that an artwork is partly self-contained and has to be judged on its own terms, not that everything going on around it culturally or politically is irrelevant, but that you have to make an argument for why certain aspects of a thing's context are relevant, because not all aspects are. So what does Kant think about architecture? As you may know, Kant does not have a high opinion of architecture for the simple reason that architecture is useful, which means architecture is relational for Kant. Architecture has a purpose outside of itself. It's not self-contained. Whereas for Kant, pure beauty which is a positive term for him, pure beauty is something self-contained. It's something that can't be reduced to a purpose, cannot be reduced to a conceptual meaning, cannot be reduced to our personal reaction to it. And so he puts architecture on a very low level, not as low as Schopenhauer, of course, because Schopenhauer puts architecture on the same level as water fountains, aesthetically. Uh, and it's partly because architecture is not alive. It's 
made of inanimate materials, which for Schopenhauer means something is missing from it. In Kant's case, he gives a couple of other examples of kinds of beauty that can never be pure beauty. One of those is the beauty of horses. We can all admire a beautiful horse, but for Kant, the, the beauty of the horse is never pure. It's a beauty connected with ulterior motives. For instance, the fact that a beautiful horse looks very fast. It looks like we can ride it very fast, which is useful. It looks like maybe that horse can win a race, and so we can put a bet on the horse and win money at the horse race. And so the beauty of a horse is never self-contained for, for Kant for that reason. Kant also says the beauty of a human being is never self-contained for that reason. If you imagine a very, very beautiful human of either sex, uh, the judgment of this beauty, according to Kant, is again mixed with the ulterior motives of lust or the wish to be in a couple with that person. Uh, it's never a pure contemplation of the sort that Kant thinks uh, is required for pure beauty. And so those are examples, along with architecture, of things that will never reach the highest status of aesthetics uh, for Kant's. Now, I say that Kant is wrong. And I'll just do a brief digression here to say why I think Kant is wrong. Some of you may know the contemporary art critic, Michael Fried. He's still alive. We invited him to SciArc five years ago. He gave a wonderful week of lectures. And you can view Michael Fried in a way as a very Kantian art critic, art historian. Back in the 1960s, Michael Fried wrote a famous attack on minimalist arts. The reason for his, his critique, of course, uh, Fried is a formalist critic, and Fried thinks minimalist art is theatrical, too theatrical, which means he thinks that if an artist just puts a white cube in a room or a metal rod on the wall, this is trying to provoke a reaction out of you that the artist, the gallery, is probably creating an ominous lighting condition in the gallery so that you have a kind of theatrical experience when you approach this object. And for Fried, theatricality ruins art. Because at, for Fried as for Kant, art should be about a disinterested contemplation where you're standing at a distance contemplating uh, the artwork in a calm and peaceful manner that does not include your theatrical involvement. He also talks about French painting in the 18th century as being a good example of this. And he refers to Denis Diderot, Denis Diderot, excuse me, as, as uh, an example of another anti-theatrical critic, because Diderot was always making these same points, that a painting should look as though the characters in the painting don't care that anyone is watching them. Otherwise, it's theatrical. And so Diderot and, and Fried after him point to a number of cases of French painting where the characters are very absorbed in something, like blowing a soap bubble. They're concentrating on blowing this large soap bubble, and so they're not watching us at all. Or in one case, the drawer of a desk is pushed out in the painting, as if to push off, push away the viewers, so that there's a wall between the painting and us. Now, even in his early work, Michael Fried admits that this is a fiction, because obviously paintings require beholders, as he calls them. Paintings require viewers. If all humans were killed in a nuclear war, the art objects might still be here, but there would not really be art. That's my opposition to, to Fried's point. That uh, uh, Fried thinks an art object is self-contained and is an artwork whether humans are there or not. I say that's not the case. Uh, there needs to be some human involvement, otherwise you don't have a painting. Now, the interesting thing is that Fried, as he continues to write his history of French painting, which is three books, realizes more and more that his concept of anti-theatricality won't work. There has to be a human involvement with the artwork. So after his book on, on painting in the 1700s, he moves to the painting of Courbet in France in the early 1800s. And he talks, he has to admit that there are many ways in which Courbet's paintings break down the distinction between the beholder and the figures in the painting. For instance, Courbet paints himself into many of his canvases. You can see that many of the figures in Courbet's paintings actually represent Courbet himself. They even seem to be holding a palette and a, a paintbrush that might be a hammer and a something else that are representing a, a palette and a paintbrush. Until finally he gets to the third book of his trilogy on Edouard Binet, usually considered the major or at least first modern painter. And uh, what he notices about Manet's paintings is that in Manet's great paintings, there's always a central character who is turning and staring directly at you, the beholder, as if inviting you to participate. In two famous cases, it's a naked woman, which really draws the beholder's attention. But usually there is at least some character, it might even be a figure, it might even be a dog who is turning and staring at the beholder. 
And this is just one of the reasons he has to admit against his own wishes that Manet has a certain element of theatricality. He calls it facingness. The painting is facing the beholder directly. So I mentioned Freed to give an example of why Kant's idea of complete non-theatricality is not possible. That ultimately an artwork is not just made of the work. An artwork is a compound entity made of the work and the person beholding it, experiencing it, participating in it. Just like water is not just made of hydrogen or not just made of oxygen, right? That it's made of hydrogen and oxygen. It's a hybrid object. So too is an art object, right? An art object is a hybrid made of the beholder and the work. Now, so how can that be realist? How can that be non-relationist? How can it be formalist if I say against Freed that the object and the work need each other? Well, because that relation between the object and the work is a limited relation. When you are experiencing an artwork, you are not also experiencing the entire social political context in which that work was made. You may be aware of certain features of that social political context, but primarily you and the work are cut off from everything else in the world in that moment. You form a new object that may admit certain influences from the outside, but relations always take work. They're not take, they shouldn't be taken for granted as if all relations were ubiquitous and everything affects everything else in a holistic way. Things are to some extent cut off and you have to explain how they can interact, how they can affect each other. All right, so that was my statement on Kant and why Kant places architecture very low on his list. But then I also talked about why Kant's complete separation of the work and the beholder is not possible. That there's always an interaction, that an artwork is always an interweaving of the beholder and the work. This already points to a way that shows us that Kant's critique of architecture is not entirely valid. Because if even a painting already requires an interaction with the beholder, then that's all the more true for architecture, which after all is built for human purposes and for humans to observe and humans with, and it, architecture is created in human space, usually in some urban context. And so therefore Kant's objections to architecture are already breaking down. And also uh, the fact that Kantian aesthetics becomes unsustainable for the reasons I've just mentioned. The fact that you cannot completely cut off the work from the beholder or from the interpreter. This means that architecture, since it deals with this problem more directly by requiring architectural objects to interact with humans, is already our best guide for working to an aesthetic theory that goes beyond Kant's. Architecture, I think, will be our guide guidepost. Uh, most Periods in the history of philosophy and aesthetics have favored one art form over another. In certain periods, it's literature. For Nietzsche, it's either music or opera. For Roland Barthes, it's photography. Um, uh, philosophers always have their favorite artistic genre that they use as the showcase for their aesthetic theories. I think insofar as Kantian aesthetics is beginning to break down without collapsing into the Hegelian version of putting an artwork completely in its time and place, I think architecture is going to be our guide into the next era of philosophical aesthetics. And that's what I'm trying to do in my book, Architecture and Objects, which will be published in June or July uh, by University of Minnesota Press, my first book on architecture after six years at SIARC. All right, so let's talk about form and function again. And uh, Dimitri kindly mentioned the concepts of zero form and zero function. I am going to speak about that now, but let me first give some background to this. What does zero form mean? What does zero function mean? First of all, the, from an object-oriented standpoint, the problem with the concepts of form and function in architecture is that they are both interpreted in a relational sense. Function is the relation of the building to its social purposes and maybe to its dialogue with the structures that are around it, its contextual existence. That's relational. But form also, form in architecture t t uh, sorry, tends to mean the visual look of a building. And I'm going to explain why that's not really the form. That's the most superficial version of the form of a building. Uh, the visual look of a building is merely the, the skin of what we mean by form in architecture. And for the reasons I've mentioned, object-oriented ontology is always trying to dig beneath the relational sense of any concept what is intrinsic to the architectural object that is not fully expressed in its relation, not fully expressed in its form or its function. So that's the first step. 
The second thing I wanted to mention is what zero means in this context, zero form, zero function. This goes back to an article I wrote back in 2009 about the philosophy of mind, and this is easy to explain quickly. One of the main philosophical debates in the philosophy of mind is the argument between third person scientific descriptions and first person experience. So for instance, people who are scientifically oriented on this question will say, uh, consciousness can be scientifically explained in two ways. First of all, uh, you can explain how the neurons in the brain are firing and what the patterns are of the neurology in your brain. You explain that, and then you can also explain how somebody behaves. There it is, consciousness is explained. Consciousness means nothing more than you have certain things going on in your brain and you also behave in a certain way that science is gonna measure and describe from the outside in a third person fashion. That's the scientific approach to consciousness, which you find in people like Daniel Dennett and others. Uh, the third person scientific description is all we need and it will exhaustively be able to describe what we mean by our minds. Then on the other side of this debate, you have people who insist on the first person experience of consciousness. And David Chalmers from Australia is perhaps the most famous of these. He talks about the hard problem in the philosophy of mind that people like Dennett avoid. The hard problem is trying to figure out what does it mean to have conscious experience? How can we jump from this group of atom molecules and tissues in our brain to feeling alive and feeling like I'm having an experience as a real person in this world. That's the hard problem, according to Chalmers. You cannot explain that scientifically. You have to rely on a first person description of an introspection of what it's like to be me. And maybe we can wonder what it's like to be a bat or what it's like to be a dog or what it might be like to be a artificial intelligence computer. A little harder to do than looking at my own mind, but still we, in principle, we can ask, what is it like to be another living creature? What is it like to be each of you in my audience today? I know what it's like to be me. I can only deduce what it's like to be each of you. That's Chalmers. And so this argument between third person and first person perspectives uh, continues. The problem with it, as I see, is that both of these somehow miss it. So both of these, both of these perspectives somehow miss what's really important because they're both descriptions. And anything you describe is always going to be different from your description of it. And so if we look at the third person and the first person descriptions, yes, I can describe what's happening in my brain or your brain if I have the right equipment. I can describe how each of us is behaving in public and what that means. But these descriptions are never going to be exhaustive. They're never going to be perfectly accurate. There's always going to be something in the things that our descriptions never quite get right. There's always going to be a future open to increase knowledge, and we're never going to get there. The, the objects are never translatable into prose statements is another way of putting it. This is one of the basic principles of object-oriented ontology. Object-oriented ontology is anti-literalist. Literalism means the idea that you can replace a thing by a very good description of it, by a very accurate knowledge of it. But you can't because knowledge or a description is always only a model of what it describes and therefore third person scientific description will inevitably miss something in the things it describes. So that's the problem with third person description. What about first person introspection? Well, there too, you will never accurately know yourself by introspecting. You, you will never accurately understand yourself. This is why psychoanalysis exists. This is why a lot of times we learn more about ourselves from our friends than we do from thinking about ourselves. We learn things about ourselves from feedback from others because it's very difficult for under, to understand ourselves sometimes to accurately grasp what we are good at, what we are bad at, uh, whether our decisions make sense. This is why we often go for advice to others because we need that perspective from outside. And often even very late in life, we can learn amazing things about ourselves that we never knew were true. And so first person introspection ultimately is no more direct a knowledge than the scientific description of a thing from outside. And this is why I introduced the concept of zero person perspective. The zero person perspective is simply what you are, what you are that no first person or third person description can ever adequately describe. The zero person perspective, perspective isn't even a perspective. It's just what you are, what an object is, and the best thing we can do is get at that indirectly. 
which is why sometimes metaphorical language, hints, suggestions, innuendos are the best way we have of describing a thing. And I often think of threats as a good example of this. A vague threat is always more threatening than a specific threat. With the example I all, always use being from Godfather, the film that many of you have probably seen, where the, the threat, the repeated threat in the film is always, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse, which is a lot scarier than saying, I'm going to cut off your horse's head and put it in your bed at night when you're sleeping, and you're going to wake up with a bloody horse's head, which is actually what happens in the film to so the, the Hollywood man who doesn't do what the mafia leader wants. It's much more threatening to simply imply, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. The consequences might surprise you. That's much scarier. The same thing for jokes. If you explain a joke, the joke is ruined. So the joke needs to be left unexplained to continue to be funny. And there are many examples of this, a metaphor being another. If you try to explain a metaphor in prose language, you're going to lose the effect of the metaphor. So oftentimes, indirect language is the best tool we have. And of course, in the arts, this is paramount. An artwork or an architectural work does not have a meaning in the simple sense that you can replace it by words. Uh, whereas a scientific discovery might, right? you might be able to explain exactly what the significance of a scientific discovery is in a couple of sentences. That's going to be much harder or even impossible to do in the aesthetic realm, in the arts or architecture. Right. So anyway, now we're back to zero, zeroing. How can we zero form and how can we zero function and why should we want to? Well, because we don't want architecture to be literalist, primarily because architecture is an art. We can say this building here serves the following function, but that's, you want a little bit more than that, right? You want the building to be somewhat detached from its current function so that it is, um, it has a certain autonomy that can command our respect and our attention. And one easy way we can see this is the fact that many buildings change their functions over time and yet still remain somewhat the same. Uh, the building where I work, the SciArc building in Los Angeles, I don't know if any of you have been there ever, uh, but if you go, you'll see that it was originally a train station. It was meant to be a place where trains would unload their cargo to store it for a railroad in uh, Los Angeles that was built over 100 years ago. And I've forgotten exactly when that closed, right? They closed the building. And then at some point, the building fell into disrepair and the roof was collapsing and homeless people were living in there. And so then it became a kind of uh, makeshift homeless shelter in downtown Los Angeles. One day I was riding in an Uber and my Uber driver told me that when he was in high school, he used to organize rave parties in there. Um, with techno music and things like that. And he actually would go ahead of time and pay the homeless people to leave for one night so that they could use that as a place for techno parties. So already it's had three uses. It was a train station for cargo. It was a place for homeless people to live. It was a, a place for techno rave parties. And then in around 2000, SciArc uh, purchased the building and converted it into our new campus. And now it's very nicely remodeled and everything. It's no longer a train station. It's now an architecture school, but there are certain aspects of the building that reflect its original character as a train station. It is very long and skinny, for example, because it was designed for train cars to pull up to it, unload and leave. It's not designed for lots of people to be walking around in a large space. So it's very long and skinny, which means it takes a long time to get from one end to the other means that you will always meet other SciArc people as you're walking down the hall because there's really only one hall for most of the building because it's so skinny a building and so that changes the nature of the interactions because you're you're guaranteed to see almost everyone when you walk down the hall you can't avoid people unless you go outside and sneak around to the other edge outside um so that those are examples but there are two other examples i want to give you of zeroing function one of the classic examples is in aldo rossi's book from the 1960s, The Architecture of the City. And some of you may recall that there's a section in that book called A Critique of Naive Functionalism. And Rossi, like many others, was reading modernism as, as functionalist in this sense. Rossi was talking about monuments in that book. And of course, Italy has a lot of monuments, a lot of very old buildings that have been around for a thousand years and are still being used, but many of them are used for different purposes now than they were used for when they were built. 
You can find a 13th century building in an Italian city that now has laundry in it or a cyber cafe. It's very common there. And he says, the monument therefore is more than any specific function. The monument is not determined by the functions going on around it. Instead, the functions in the city are determined by its monuments, especially in a place like Italy that has so much history still there. So uh, uh, Alderosi's book is one thing I wanted to talk about there. Another thing I wanted to talk about here is um, an essay that Jeffrey Kipnis wrote about uh, Rem Kohlhaus called Recent, sorry, Recent Kohlhaus. It's not recent anymore because this was written in the 1990s. But Kipnis was writing about Rem Kohlhaus's failed entry for the competition for the Tate Modern in London, which some of you may have visited. Uh, and if so, you'll know that the Tate Modern was a power plant, an electricity generating plant, which was eventually converted into a modern art museum. And so there's still a large smokestack and the competition required that the smokestack be kept in the design. And Rem lost this, this competition, which was won by Herzog and de Moyen and built by them. And uh, Kipnis writes this uh, rather interesting, enthusiastic and also unenthusiastic article about Kohlhaus's building. He says, it's a fantastic design, but if it had won the competition, it would have destroyed architecture. Because according to Kipnis, uh, Rem's building is basically meant to simply be a high functioning performance bringing the maximum number of people through the art museum in the shortest amount of time. And so he views it almost as an infrastructure or engineering project rather than an architectural project. And so Kipnis is glad that Rem's entry failed the competition. At the same time, uh, Kipnis makes some other points about the building that I think are more positive and maybe more productive, such as the fact that Kohlhaus, Rem Kohlhaus succeeded in designing a building that isn't tied to any particular function. Kip, uh, Kohlhaus's design does not have to be an art museum. He somehow is reducing the, the functionality of that building to its bare bones, to its nervous system, as, as Kipnis puts it. It's like a very abstract functional building, meaning that it could be used for lots of different things, right? That um, um, in a way, uh, Kohlhaus has retained the function while detaching it from any specific function. In other words, he's making the function autonomous from its specific function. The functionality of the building is different somehow from its specific function as an art museum. And as if to, to represent this, uh, Rem Kohlhaus violated the rule of the competition that you're supposed to keep the smokestack. He actually reduced it to the metallic skeleton of the smokestack. He took out all the bricks in his design. So um, this is one good example of how an architect can subtract a function from its specific function. And this could be a good example of zero function in the triple O sense. Now, what about zero form? Why is the visual look of a building not enough to be considered its form? Well, I think the most obvious reason is that you cannot see the entire building at once. Any visual appearance of a building is going to be a visual appearance of the building from a specific place at a specific distance at a specific time. At the very least, you have to circle the building to see how its form looks from different angles. And in the case of some buildings, that's very complex. Uh, and then there's the case of the interior of the building where you have to go in and explore. And this requires a series of images. And interestingly, the young Peter Eisenman, one of his very first articles, talks about this. He, he wouldn't emphasize this today, but back in his youth, he emphasized that architecture is a temporal art, much like a novel or a film where you have to experience an arch an arch a piece of architecture never in a single moment, right? A painting in principle you can experience in a single moment. You might always be noticing new details in the painting, but you have the whole painting there in front of you in one instant, which was one of Fried's points when talking about non-theatrical painting. Um, with a sculpture, you need a little more time, right? Because you might need to see the sculpture from several angles to get the full sense of it, but it's not gonna be that much time. Well, in architecture though, like film and like a piece of literature, you need time to go through it. Now, the difference of course, is that a literature or a film, you have to go through it in a certain order. You have to start at the beginning and go to the end. Architecture gives you a little more flexibility because you can explore it in any order. You can linger in one place for a while. And so the power of time is more on the side of the beholder or spectator in the case of architecture than it is in the case of film or, or novels. So since, let me just give an analogy here. The problem we saw with function 
perception is that it's initially too relational, right? It's it, a building is too tied to a specific purpose. And the ways that I mentioned that you can separate them is by um, detaching the function from any specific function. And the ways of doing that, I mentioned Rossi, I mentioned Kipnis's interpretation of Kohlhaus. Now with form, the problem could be the opposite, right? Because um, I said at first, form is visual, which, which means the form of the building is interpreted too relationally. The form of the building is how it relates to my eyes. That's the usual interpretation of form. But now if we go to a deeper form, first of all, let's talk about some of the ways of doing that. Let's talk about going to a non-relational form. There are a couple of ways I can think of of doing that. One of them was outlined by Tom Wiscombe um, in his essay, Discreteness or the Flat Ontology of Architecture. The title is something like that. I'm forgetting the exact title at the moment. And one of the techniques that Wiscombe mentions there for zeroing form, though he doesn't use that terminology, is to hide the form of the building behind a kind of loose outer sac or envelope so that you get the sense that there's a cube or a pyramid under the envelope, but it's kind of vaguely shrouded by this, this veil or this outer envelope that's covering it up. So you have to kind of guess what the form of it is. Okay, that's one way. There's another way though, which um, this involves a little philosophy. I don't know if people are familiar with uh, the philosophical puzzle of the ship of Theseus, uh, which involves the question of, okay, the ship of Theseus in ancient Greece was the ship that Theseus uh, sailed to kill the Minotaur in, Greek, in Crete, one of the most heroic moments in the legends of Athens. Um, people of Athens had had to sacrifice seven boys and seven girls to the Minotaur at a regular basis. Theseus, the great hero of Athens, went and killed the Minotaur. And so now to honor this great hero, they um, sail the ship of Theseus to an island every so often and have a religious festival to honor his heroism. Then the philosophical puzzle is this. Let's say they've had the ship of Theseus around for a hundred years or so, and one of the pieces of wood is rotting. So they take off that rotten piece of wood and replace it with a fresh piece of wood. And then maybe the next year, another piece of wood is rotting. So they take that away and put in a fresh piece of wood. So maybe after a certain number of years, none of the original wood is there in the ship, right? That, um, um, none of the original physical material of the ship of Theseus is still there. And then meanwhile, somebody is taking the old and rotten wood and rebuilding another ship with that. So now you have one ship that was originally Theseus's ship, but all the pieces have been replaced. And then you have another ship uh, that has all the old wood, but all that old wood has been assembled separately into a new ship. So the question philosophers have always asked is, which of these is the real ship of Theseus? Now, the problem with the way that that is posed is that it assumes that to have the real ship of Theseus, you need to preserve a thing. You need to preserve the details of a thing. So either you're trying to preserve the actual physical materials, or you're trying to preserve the form, the way the ship of Theseus looked originally with fresh woods. Now, it seems to me that a lot of times the way to preserve a thing is to make it more abstract, to get rid of unnecessary detail, right? To take away some of the detail and boil a thing down to its skeleton just like Rem Kohlhaus did with the smokestack on the Tate. He's saying you don't actually need all these individual bricks. You just need the original underlying skeleton of the, the metallic framework that's holding up the chimney at the power plant. And so oftentimes abstraction in design is a way to make the form more real by stripping away extraneous detail. And so that's another thing to, to um, consider. And so I'll end on the following remark since I think we're about out of time here. And that remark is, um, if you want to emphasize and, and capitalize on the fact that architecture has to be a temporal art, then you will want inner complexity. You won't want a modern art interior where something is purely geometrical or empty. You're going to want um, a certain complex experience, not so complex that the person cannot remember it who's been there, but complex enough that a number of unlike experiences have been welded together. And I'll give you an example by looking at two buildings by Frank Gehry that I happen to have seen both in person. One of them is the very famous one of the Guggenheim in Bilbao, which is a monumental building in a certain sense. It has already turned Bilbao into a tourist destination. And most people going to Bilbao go there initially in order to see Gehry's Guggenheim Museum. However, one thing you'll notice is that almost all photographs you see of Gehry's Guggenheim are from the outside. 
the outside is kind of like an artwork. It's almost like a sculpture. It's really fun to walk around that building. And as if to emphasize that, there are at least two major artworks outside. There's Jeff Koons' Flower Puppy, and there's Louise Bourgeois' Giant Spider, both of them very famous works of, of reasonably contemporary arts. As soon as you go on the inside of the Guggenheim Bilbao, you are likely to be disappointed as I was. There's not much going on there. There's not that many rooms. And the way the rooms are arranged is very, um, tra very traditional in the modern sense. There's not a lot of complexity. There's not a lot going on. And so maybe after about 10 or 15 minutes, you'll find yourself wanting to go back outside and simply experience the Guggenheim there as a, a sculpture more than as a building. By contrast, I've also been to Gary's Louis Vuitton building in Paris, which I think is wonderful. Not only is the form wonderful, but there are a remarkable number of somewhat puzzling asymmetrical experiences on the interior, such as a, a surprising stairwell that goes to a deck where you get an interesting view of Paris. And I, find my, I found myself not wanting to leave the Louis Vuitton building. So in what sense is this zero form? It's zero form because you are splicing together a number of independent forms, all of which are fairly deep and, and unknowable, and you're creating a new form out of there, which is enhancing the mystery of the forms of those individual parts. So that's what I mean by zero form and zero function. And um, I also wanna end by saying, if you've heard a little bit about object-oriented ontology, you might think that object-oriented ontology is about the hiddenness of objects. It's actually not so much about the hiddenness of objects as it is about the tension between objects and their own qualities. The fact that an object ambiguously both has and does not have its own qualities. And I will end there on that note. And uh, Dimitri, could I have a five minute break before the question starts? Yes, of course, of course. I'll be right back. Take your time. 
for the people attending on WebEx, you can ask your questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so welcome back, Graham Harmon. First of thank all, you. thank you for uh, for this talk. Uh, thank you for your time and for your thoughts. Um, I was just telling the people attending on WebEx uh, to ask their questions in the chat. In the meantime, I think we, we do have a few questions here in the auditorium, if uh, anybody wants to start. Sure. Um, hi, Mr. Herman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, first, thank you for this lecture. I have uh, actually questions about the triple O philosophy because I've sure. heard a little bit ab about it. So, uh, first question is that this, this ontology takes every kind of entity seriously, but while all things equally exist, they do not exist equally, as Ian Bogast would put it. So, the question is what makes an object more valuable? Is there some kind of hierarchy of power? because not all object can surprise us. And if it does exist, uh, is that has more value, does it make it more eligible to take part of a whole? Well, um, certainly some objects are more interesting. Uh, one of the issues that often comes up is that Triple O argues against the priority of, of human thoughts and ontology. And uh, sometimes that's misinterpreted to mean that humans are not of more value of, or of more interest than anything else. So, for example, I just saw somebody yesterday on Facebook complaining that uh, the Ukraine invasion somehow disproves triple O because it shows that human suffering is more important than the suffering of a chair or something like that. Except that the triple O never said that humans aren't more politically important than inanimate objects. It says that humans are not ontologically more real than inanimate objects that in the entire modern tradition thinks that hum human thought is at the center of everything and we have to begin with human thoughts before we talk about inanimate objects, that is a problem in, in modern ontology. The idea that the thought world relation takes too much priority over other relations. That says nothing about politics and that says nothing about values uh, because um, uh, values Values, certain, Spinoza will tell us that values are, are species relative and even individual relative, right? That if all humans are killed in a nuclear war, that's how, that situation is a very high value for cockroaches. However disastrous it is for humans, cockroaches will flourish. Just like the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs was a very valuable thing for mammals who were able to fill in the cracks that the dinosaurs left behind. Uh, another case of this is when people, people accuse Triple O of commodity fetishism in the Marxist sense, where Marx uh, criticizes those who say that a coat has a value apart from the social relations that produced it. Okay, except that Marx is talking about value, Triple O is talking about existence. So yes, uh, uh, the value of a coat and the creation of a coat requires a whole human social system of production for that to happen. That doesn't mean the existence of a coat requires that it exists only in terms of what value it has for humans. The coat is also an autonomous thing that has a certain reality, even if no human or al humans are alive or no humans are using it. So our first step is to try to create a flat ontology so that all things are considered equally by philosophy, but that's only a starting point. You can't get very far if you just say everything is equally real. That's just the starting point to reset, to press the reset button on modern ontology, which puts human thought too much in the center of things. After that, there are all kinds of reasons to distinguish between different kinds of beings and different regions of discussion. I, I hope that helped answer your question. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Dimitri, can sure. Sorry. Okay, now it's another question uh, also about this philosophy. So uh, we're talking here about part-to-part -part relationship, which is interesting. So this, uh, it's, it's like this relationship, it's like with, with coherence and discreteness. Uh, and we're tackling uh, the estrangement of the real. So the question is, do we qualify this estrangement uh, as a figuration or an, ab or an abstraction? And what about the legibility of architectural objects? Does it, the strangeness overshadow representation? Generally speaking, I think a little bit of strangeness helps any aesthetic work. Uh, otherwise, you're likely to end up with literalism, where an object is dissolved into its message into what it's explicitly trying to um, portray. And I think you get this in certain buildings that try too hard to look like real objects. Um, Mark Foster Gage, for 
example, often criticizes Calatrava's transport building in New York because it's supposed to look like a dove that's spreading its wings. That might be too representative. I don't have strong opinions about that, my, that building myself. But um, uh, a, a certain strangeness is what indicates in an aesthetic context that the work is not entirely literal. It cannot be paraphrased in terms of a message or anything else or an appearance. Uh, and so strangeness is a nice spice to put in any aesthetic work, a certain amount of indeterminacy, a certain amount of illegibility. But you don't want to go too far. Um, Aristotle talks about why in his poetics. He talks about, imagine a poem where every line is a metaphor. Then it's going to become a riddle. The example he gives is if you say in ancient Greece, I saw a man glue bronze on a man with fire. That's a riddle. You have no idea what that means. It's too many metaphors. Turns out what it means is it's referring to an ancient Greek medical procedure where they would burn the wound of a person to sterilize it. But the way the poet has just expressed it turns it into a riddle because it's all metaphors. So you need a certain amount of literal ballast. You need a certain amount of functionality. You need a certain amount of intelligibility uh, to make a thing graspable and then have a bit of strangeness involved on top of that. Marshall McLuhan, the great Canadian media theorist, talks about how when he sent his great book, Understanding Media, to the publisher, the publisher first responded, the problem with your book is that 90% of your book is new. A successful book should only be 10% new because readers cannot handle that much novelty in a book. It's too confusing for them. Everything is disorienting if it's all too new. You should have a certain amount of reassuring familiarity in anything you produce with targeted points of mysteriousness, ambiguity, innovation, I would say. And I don't know if that answers exactly what you yes, meant with your question. But but does it still... Uh... Uh, no, is it still leg legitimate uh, if there is too much strangers in, in the work or uh, or it, not? It, well, that's for critics to decide. But it, it, I can imagine a case where an architectural work is too weird to be comprehensible. And it's e easy to think of such cases if you imagine transporting certain buildings backwards in time. I don't think Gary's buildings or Rem's buildings would make any sense to people in the Renaissance, for instance. Uh, there, there will be too much innovation there. That, that's why history has to happen gradually in a way. You need to build on what has already happened and give it a little extra twist. But if, if I were to jump ahead and look at the philosophy of 500 years from now, I'm sure I wouldn't understand a word of it uh, because it would just be too foreign to what I'm used to. There would have been too many important philosophers in the, in the 500 years following now that have changed the discourse. I wouldn't really understand what's going on if I were to pick up. Imagine Aristotle reading Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. There's no way he could understand it. Even in even when people know each other, Husserl didn't really understand Heidegger's being in time, and they were only 30 years apart in age. So that these are examples of how um, um, too much strangeness can somehow make a thing too illegible or too surprising. So uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question myself now. Sure. So uh, I saw that there is actually a bit of a gap between the anthropocentrism and actor network theory, which essentially is a form of correlationism between objects, and where we actually ended up with the derelationization in architecture with zero form and zero function. But like, as I said in my, uh, in my introduction, and which you showed also in your lecture today, is that you have a sort of anchoring in stuff that came before you, and uh, actor network theory is one of those things that you anchor yourself in. And yes. I think we can see a bit of evolution from the actor network theory to flat ontology to object-oriented ontology to so uh, zero function and zero form. But where is that missing link between the anthropo anthropocentrism that's in actor network theory, which is a correlationism, and where we ended up actually with zero relations in zero form and zero function? Like there's, I feel like there's a missing link, like relations uh, just poofed out of the picture. Well, one missing link may be looking at object-object relations uh, without humans. And uh, this is something philosophy has not been able to do really since Kant, because for Kant, we cannot talk about fire burning cotton, which is the old example from Islamic philosophy in the Middle Ages. We can only talk about how the fire-cotton relation appears to humans, to human thoughts. Uh, Latour at his best, I think, gives us the resources to 
talk about object-object relations without humans. There are some cases in his work of that. But then at the end of the day, I think Latour wants to revert everything to the human perspective of an inner. He's more a philosopher of science than a philosopher of nature. That's the difference between Latour and, say, Alfred North Whitehead, is that Latour has a harder time than Whitehead of talking about object-object relations without human thoughts. And this is why he's been criticized for things like saying that uh, the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II cannot have died of tuberculosis because tuberculosis had not been discovered yet. These are some of Latour's most anti-realist statements. So the first step, I think, is to see that object-object relations are the most interesting discovery of actor network theory. And then all you have to do, I think, is, is bring a little bit of Heidegger into the picture and see that you know, for Heidegger, things withdraw from human understanding. There's something hidden in any, from any human understanding. If humans try to understand a chair or a city, they never fully get it. Something in the object withdraws. The small step you take, it's not a small step, it's a big step in many people's eyes, but it was small for me, is to say this also happens in the relations between objects. So when the medieval Islamic philosophers talk about fire burning cotton, they are aware that fire cannot burn cotton directly. For them, it's a religious reason. It's that God must be burning the cotton. There's also, however, a metaphysical reason you can give, an ontological reason, which is that two objects touching each other never fully react with all of each other's properties. Fire does not interact with the color and the softness of the cotton. It is only interacting with the parts of the cotton that make it burnable, flammable. And so, from, in this way, you can see that relations between inanimate things are just as limited as relations between thought and world. Finitude is universal. It's not just something that haunts humans. How's that for an answer? Did I miss something? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think I can judge anyways. But I feel like, I, like uh, my, my question still stands in the sense that in object-oriented ontology, object-object relations still stands as to human-object relations, since human becomes just another object. Isn't Right. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to actually uh, go to the questions in the chat. Uh, we have the first question, which is by, uh, I can't see the user. Uh, uh, there is a question by uh, Gregory Tausson, which is a professor here at uh, the Académie Libanaise des Beaux-Arts. Uh, okay. he, also, he also studied at SciArc before coming here. Oh, so great. he's asking, Mr. Harmon, thank you for this amazing lecture. His question is, how your new way of looking at object is different from Husserl phenomenology which argue that we have to come back to the thing in itself. Is it a continuity of it? I would draw a distinction here between the thing itself and the thing in itself. Uh, return to the things themselves is what Husserl says. He wants us to actually look at things the way they really appear, whereas the thing in itself is Kant's terminology. And Husserl considers Kant's perspective to be absurd. Um, I'm just working on Husserl in an article on Husserl these days, so I've been reviewing all of this lately. Um, for Husserl, it's absurd that there could be a thing that is unable to fully appear to the mind. For Husserl, anything that's real can, for that very reason, be made directly apparent to the mind if we think hard enough, if we try hard enough not to get distracted. So there is no hidden city of Berlin that nobody can see, no hidden real Berlin, no Berlin in itself. There is simply the Berlin that exists in the world, and that's the same Berlin that I can analyze as an urban historian or as a sociologist. That's Husserl's view. What Husserl disallows is the idea of a withdrawn object, the idea that there could be an object that never becomes fully apparent to us. This is the contribution made by his student, Heidegger. The fact that something can never fully become present to it, it's always going to be hidden to a large extent, and we're only going to be seeing samples of the outside of it. Whereas for Husserl, returning to the things themselves means we can actually understand the things themselves intellectually. Our senses might confuse us, but if we focus on mental acts, and on categorical intuition, and on trying to strip away the inessential features of a thing and focus on the essential features, we can actually gain knowledge of the real, according to Husserl. Whereas Triple O is a little closer to Kant and Heidegger's position here, which is that there is a thing in itself that can be thought but never known. It's, we can only approach it. We have to get at it indirectly. We can never bring it directly before the mind. But having said that, Husserl is very important. And I think one of the things he's most important for, for Triple O, is showing that an object is never the same as its qualities. If I, if I take this pen and rotate it through different angles and dimensions, I can see uh, different sides of the pen at different times, and the pen is always something more than any one of those sides. So there is a difference between the object and any of its qualities. Um, this was actually lost a bit somewhat by Maurice Merleau-Ponty, one of, one of the great phenomenologists following Husserl, because Merleau-Ponty says, 
in the phenomenology of perception that uh, the house is not the house viewed from nowhere, the house is a house viewed from everywhere. So simply add up all the possible views of a house and that's the house. Well, the problem with that is that a house is not made of views. A house has to exist before you have views of it. And so a house actually is essentially that, that which cannot be viewed. It makes the views possible, but it's something deeper than any specific view you're going to have of it. You can't just add up a bunch of views and then have the thing. A thing is not made of photographs, right? Take as many selfies of yourself as you want. It's still not going to be you. Even if you take a billion of them, even if you take medical cameras inside your body and photograph selfies of your throat from the inside, you're never going to have you, no matter how many photographs you take. So I'd say that's that's the big difference between Heidegger and Tripolo on one side and Husserl on the other, though I have a great admiration for Husserl. He's not read enough these days. Uh, so uh, we still have three questions in the chat. We're not going to take any more. Uh, would you like okay. me to read the three or do you have time to take them one by one? I can take them one by one. Okay, so we're going to start with the first by Adam Bobak. Uh, he's saying, could Professor Harmon talk about the difference between form versus function and form versus content? Yes, and nice to have contact with you again, Adam. Um, we crossed paths once before. All right. Form versus content, you can think of in terms, best, you can best think of in terms of media theory, I would say. Let's talk about McLuhan again. Uh, someone has really influenced me. The difference between form and content there, we can speak of, for example, a medium like television. Uh, most people, when they think about television, will be talking about the content of different television shows. Which shows are the best? What is the plot of Ozark as opposed to the plot of Breaking Bad? What are the similarities and differences? Which shows storylines are best developed? Which ones have the best characters? All right, whereas McLuhan would say, that's not what you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on the difference between television and radio, because no matter what television show you're watching, you are watching television. And that medium has certain features that we usually aren't thinking of because we're thinking too much about the content of the show. We're not thinking about the background features of the medium that are different from radio. And so then McLuhan goes on to make some interesting ob observations about the differences. For example, he suggests that Hitler would have done very badly on television, <clears throat> that Hitler could have only come to power on radio because he, he was a very exciting shouting speaker for the German people and was able to persuade them that way. But try to imagine Hitler on a television show shouting like that. He looked ridiculous. He was kind of ugly. He, he's simply not a very good figure for television, and it's, it's hard to imagine him rising to power as a television show host, as opposed to a radio speech maker. Also, McLuhan talks about the first American television debate between presidential candidates. It was the different uh, between, sorry, the debate between Kennedy and Nixon. And McLuhan says, and I don't know whether this is literally true, but McLuhan claims that everyone who watched television thought Kennedy won, and everyone who listened to the radio thought Nixon won the debate which maybe means that Nixon was making old fashioned political arguments. But again, he looked bad. He, he hadn't shaved well enough, he was sweating. And Kennedy had more the looks of a television star and was a better personality for television. And so um, uh, that's another case where the medium affected the outcome of the debate more than the content did. You have the same content in two different mediums with two different results. So I see the form content distinction as more about um, the background and the foreground, what you're noticing and what you're not noticing. And then McLuhan talks about different ways that those can reverse, how sometimes that which is the content of a medium can reverse into a medium, and sometimes the medium uh, dies out and then it becomes the content of a new medium. So those are reversible relations, according to McLuhan. In terms of form versus function, that's more the distinction between relational and non-relational, which is why it's challenging to make both of them um, uh, non-relational. Form should form in the Middle Ages meant substantial form. It meant what's the real structure of the thing, regardless of its interactions with anything else, regardless of whether anyone is seeing it. That's the substantial form. Whereas now when people talk about form, they're talking more about the visual shape of it, which is more like what the medievals would have called an accidental form. The fact that I'm seeing the building from this angle means that it looks like this. But that's accidental. It's just because I happen to be standing here and not there. Uh, whereas if you want to get at the real form of the building, you're looking at something more like a substantial form, which can never be seen, certainly can never be seen in one instance. It has to be, it's a temporal experience, as I was arguing. It has to be experienced across time, and then it's reliance on your memory. 
which is why the young Eisenman says these forms should all be fairly simple because humans have a better and easier time remembering fairly simple shapes. Look at a, a piece of architecture that has a lot of public acclaim, the Sydney Opera House, beloved around the world. Not only do many architects like it, but members of the public love it. They love going to Sydney and hanging out there and walking around it. What makes that form so successful? I think it's the fact that it's fairly simple, and yet it's a little bit surprising. It's somewhat asymmetrical. The basic shapes are understandable. They look like shells or hemispheres or parts of a sphere. And so you can, I, I often say this when I'm on student juries uh, here at SciArc, I tend to like student projects better when I can remember the next day what they look like, that they're simple enough that I can remember what they look like, but also strange enough that I can remember what they look like. So I'm able to, I'm a bad drawer, but I'm able to sketch them the next day. Whereas sometimes students go a little too crazy with computer software and they invent forms that are much too complicated to be remembered. And so uh, paradoxically, they become much less unusual for that reason. Because what's the difference between a 120-sided building or a 150-sided building? Both of them are too much for the human mind to remember. Rene Descartes already made this point. So I think it should be something simple, yet slightly unusual. And the detective novelist Raymond Chandler made the same point about titles. Many of his titles are like this. For example, his second book, actually his first and second book. The first book, The Big Sleep. Okay, you hear The Big Sleep, you have some idea it refers to death. But before Chandler, no one ever said the big sleep in English. It, it's not a phrase in English. He invented it. You don't say big before sleep. You don't think of sleep as something that has a size. And then his second book, Farewell, My Lovely. Okay, farewell, my and lovely are all familiar words in English. But you would never say farewell, my lovely. You don't call a lover my lovely in English. It's a little weird. And yet you understand what it means. And this is why Chandler says he chose that title, to make it a little strange yet also simple and easy to remember. I tried to do this myself with Tool Being, my first book title, Tool-Being. You have some idea what the book is about, but nobody ever said Tool Being before in English until I used it in that title. And one of the funniest things about having written that book is seeing other Heidegger scholars start to use the phrase Tool Being, even though it never existed until I used it. Um, it's a rare pleasure to, to do something weird with English and then see somebody else copy it, or many other people copy it. So I hope that helps a bit on the difference between form content and form function. So still a few questions. We have a question by Thierry Ramia, which is, sure. uh, he says, thank you for this lecture. I was wondering how would OOO translate in urbanism? Very interesting question. Um, there have been criticisms made of certain architectural paradigms that they're not suited to urbanism. For example, Patrick Schumacher says this about minimalism. You could never have a, cinema, a minimalist city. He doesn't really expound on that, but I can see why he might say that. I've always thought that a deconstructivist city would be very hard. The deconstructivism works better when it involves isolated places of disorientation in a city. That if you tried to make a whole city like that, I don't think it would work because I think you need more literalism in a city. It's not good to have all brilliant buildings in a city. I think it's good to have some boring and purely functional parts of a city and purely predictable parts. Triple O urbanism, now, now that would be interesting. Um, how could you do that without overdoing it would be my question. Because Triple O is about um, aesthetic experience and it treats aesthetic experience as driving a wedge between objects and their qualities. But would you want to do that on an urban level? Would you want to have millions of these experiences across the city of Beirut or the city of Los Angeles or any place you tried this? So it's, I honestly haven't thought much about how to translate this to an urbanist scale. I think in terms of scholarship, if you're talking about urbanist scholarship rather than city planning, I think uh, you could build on what Rossi says about monuments and how monuments help structure a city rather than being structured by a city. You can also try to identify certain objects in a city that have similar roles, similar monumental roles for, for, for structuring the way a city works and analyzing it in that way. What, why is it that certain neighborhoods crystallize in certain places? You can look at geographical objects, historical objects, and other objects that have made that happen. But again, it's not, it's, it's a fascinating question, but it's something I haven't done much with or anything with really. Uh, we also have uh, two questions from Shriyank Kamalapur. I'm sorry if I butchered the name. So, uh, Mr. Harmon, thank you for this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Thank you for the presentation, Professor Harmon. My question is, how can we distinguish between empty signifier 
and zeroing form and function. He then goes on to say, if I can club another question to the earlier one, where does a thing become a medium? And then he just sent another question, which is Solomon Benjamin's work from India comes to mind more towards urbanist sociological band, but he does not necessarily work through OOO. Okay. First question was about distinguishing empty signifiers from zeroing forms. I, I suppose um, em using empty signifiers could be one way of zeroing forms. It could be one possible strategy that you have signifiers that don't really signify anything. Uh, that would be one way of detaching a sign from its usual functional context. I'd say zero function instead of zero form. If you have a sign that usually points to something, but then use it in a way that doesn't point to anything, that's that's one interesting way of detaching an empty signifier from what it's supposed to be pointing at by, by not having it pointed at anything. Uh, I'm thinking also here of Lacan when he talks about the signifier. Uh, and what's interesting about the signifier in Lacan is that it doesn't have one signification. It has many significations. And this gives it a certain autonomy for meaning. So that if a, if a, a boy dreams about a lion, there's no univocal interpretation of this lion that a psychoanalyst can do. It, it tends to bring together many, many significations at once in ways that are hard to identify. And that is one way of zeroing the function of a sign. Yes, of detaching it from any particular sign. Yeah. So I, I think that's a good point. An empty signifier or just a deeper signifier that goes deeper than any one signification are ways of, of zeroing a function. The second question was about when does an object become a medium? I'm not sure I can add anything to what McLuhan says about that, but, but if you imagine something like a electric cars, right? Electric cars initially were an object. They're a relative rarity. You didn't see them much. Now we're getting to the point where I'm seeing a lot of Teslas in Los Angeles. And I'm, they sound different, right? They sound kind of like spaceships and they're very quiet. When does the Tesla become a medium? I suppose it becomes a medium once every apartment building has an electric charger once the society builds half a million electric chargers on the highways, which the United States is trying to do right now, so that everyone, or at least a good number of people are using the electric car, we forget about it. And we start to do other things with electric cars simply because there are enough of them. A similar thing happened with smartphones, right? Smartphones were originally a spectacle. They were announced by Steve Jobs at a news conference in 2005 or 2006 or 2007, somewhere in there. And they were kind of a luxury item that people were fascinated by. And at some point, smartphones became a medium. It's simply presumed that almost everyone has them. And so Uber can grow up on that assumption that people have smart. If you don't have a smartphone, you can't call an Uber. So Uber needs that. And what there are others, there are other, uh, uh, softwares built on top of the, the, uh, smartphone platform. There's a lot of talk these days about platform capitalism, and it's usually seen, seen as something similar, uh, sorry, something sinister. Uh, and there may be sinister things about it, but also it's just simply what happens when something becomes so widespread that it becomes a medium. We start looking at other things as the content instead. Or these glasses, right? I started wearing glasses at what age? Around 16, 17? And now I got used to it. I'm usually wearing glasses. Um, and it changes my life in certain ways. It changes my routines. If I don't have my glasses on, I'm not allowed to drive. My vision isn't good enough to drive in, Los in California without the glasses. So after a while, you stop thinking about the glasses and you start focusing on things that the glasses change in your life. You start focusing on content again. So that's, that's where it happens. It, it happens when the thing becomes common enough or frequent enough that you start taking it for granted. Uh, McLuhan calls this the overheating of a medium. That's what happens when a medium reverses into its opposite. The last question was about Solomon Benjamin, and I just don't know enough about Solomon Benjamin to answer that. Uh, would you try to make that more specific? So maybe it's something I can answer. Um, so we had actually, uh, I'm, I'm not sure he was saying something about uh, to his work in India and uh, being something about urbanism and sociological. I think he was actually talking about uh, what you were saying for the person asking about OOO and urbanism. Now, well, we had actually finished our original three questions, but uh, there's just one person left that had asked the question. I don't know if you want to take that last question, if you still have the time. Yes, I want to take it. So, <laughs> so it's from uh, Fred, no last name. Uh, thank you for this mind-blowing intervention, although quite curious to know what would be the hints Professor Harmon 
intuitively suggests to the current ALBA students when it comes to interconnect some philosophical background to their practice of architecture. Put differently, is having a certain philosophy optional or mandatory in regard to the spatial act? It's optional. There's been a lot of pushback on triple O in architecture from people who say architecture doesn't need philosophy. Because in the past, there were too many overly literal adaptations of Heidegger or Derrida or Deleuze. Uh, and architecture should just get back to architecture. You hear this a lot sometimes uh, in the field, in certain places in the field. Uh, my response to that would be, no, you shouldn't use philosophy in an overly little way, literal way in architecture. Just because Deleuze talks about folds doesn't mean you should put folds on your buildings to show you're Deleuzean. Of course not. But it's not just philosophy that has this potential problem. You also shouldn't be using chaos theory or uh, too literally or um, 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 the word is escaping me. The manipulation of very, very small particles, nanotechnology. You shouldn't be using nanotechnology over literally in architecture. You shouldn't be using uh, mathematics over literally in architecture, as some people do. There's always going to be a problem when there's too much literalism involved in the importation of one field into another, just as would happen if architectural ideas were simply literally adopted by philosophy. And I think some architects resent that philosophy has had a lot of influence on architecture, but not in the reverse. Uh, not the reverse, that there's not been a lot of emphasis of, sorry, influence of architecture on philosophy. And my response to that is be a little more patient with philosophers. Philosophers are stuck in this rather restricted model right now where everything philosophers talk about is the thought world relation. And if you're stuck in that, as we have been mostly since Kant in philosophy, with a few exceptions, it's going to be very hard to learn any lessons from architecture for philosophers. But it could happen. It could still happen. Philosophy could start becoming more open to other fields once it becomes less obsessed with the thought world relation and becomes more interested in objects again. So my advice would be read some philosophy if you're an architecture student. It can help inspire you. It might give you ideas you haven't had. But don't worry about getting the philosophy wrong. Philosophy is only interesting for architecture insofar as it gives you new architectural ideas. Don't worry so much if you're getting the philosophy right or not. Uh, and also don't worry about being a puppet of a philosopher. You're probably not going to be, right? Because architecture has so many different problems and constraints that philosophy doesn't even begin to address, that even if you're reading Heidegger's work 24 hours a day or my work 24 hours a day or Deleuze's, the chances that you're going to become a slave of one of us are very minimal because you're going to have to make discipline-specific decisions regardless that we can't help you with. And of course, people like Derrida, Deleuze, and Heidegger don't even really know architecture at all. Um, Heidegger's building dwelling thinking, although I think it's very interesting to architecture, shows that Heidegger's architectural culture simply wasn't that advanced. He's talking in terms of some really general philosophical ideas, and the same with Derrida's Point de Folie and uh, Deleuze's The Fold isn't really, it's only minimally about architecture, about Baroque architecture. So you guys already have a lot of competences that we don't have. And so that will protect you from becoming too much the slave of a philosopher automatically. So don't worry about that. So. Thank you a lot. I, I'm thanking you on behalf of all the students, professors, and faculty members here with me at ALBA. Thank you. And my best and wishes to, to Lebanon. I can't wait to come back. I love it every time I go. You would be more than welcome and to visit us here at ALBA as well. Wonderful. So thank you and have a nice day. And we're going to have a nice evening here. All right. Enjoy it. I'll be there in spirits. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.